This is Theology Refresh, Desiring God's podcast for leaders, and we're here talking the doctrine of Scripture with Kevin DeYoung. Kevin, thanks for talking with Great us to be here. today. The point of the podcast is to refresh Christian leaders on key theological topics to make these sharp and useful for everyday ministry. Kevin, when we talk about the doctrine of Scripture, where does your mind go on that topic? I just finished in the spring into the summer a uh, I it was eight or ten week series Sunday morning on the doctrine of Scripture, just going to different texts. And so my mind goes to where I started, and that was with Psalm 119. And I started there very intentionally because uh, I wanted, and what I think of first is what's the application? Okay, if, we're gonna, if we get our doctrine right, what does it look like? So what, if we're believing rightly about the Scripture and we're feeling about the Scripture like we should feel, what does that produce? What does that bubble up in us? And you see that most gloriously in Psalm 119, longest chapter in the Bible. It's all about the Word of God over and over again, statutes, precepts. And you see there that he desires the Word of God. He delights in the Word of God. He studies the Word of God. He stores up the Word of God. He sings the Word of God. He praises with the Word of God, and he prays the Word of God. I think those were my seven studies, sings, stores up, delights, desires, praises, and prays. So I, I think let's go to the text that shows us our destination with the doctrine of Scripture. And so I start with Psalm 119 because... So that's, I want my, I want the doctrine down here that gets my heart to want those things that the psalmist wants and does in Psalm 119. Hmm. In, in that series, or as you think about doctrine of scripture, are there key concepts where your mind's going to go that are helpful? So you, you probably want to talk about the, the four evangelical attributes of scripture, the authority, necessity, sufficiency, and clarity you can remember it. I did it out of order there, but remember it was scan. Mm -hmm. I guess sufficiency, clarity, authority, necessity. So I, I had a sermon on each of those. Those are just helpful handles when you begin to talk about it. The sufficiency of Scripture, that it, it gives us all we need for life and godliness. That in, tied in, I see this in Hebrews 1 in particular, tied in with the finality of Christ's redemptive work is the finality of Christ's revelatory work. So scripture, Christ is sufficient to forgive our sins, and he's sufficient as a revealing Savior as well. So the sufficiency of scripture, the clarity, which is maybe most under attack in a postmodern context, that scripture can be understood, that the, the main parts of the gospel are clear enough, that even a simple person can read it, be saved, know how to obey God the authority of Scripture, the, the right God has over our lives to tell us what is and what we ought to do and ought to be, and then the necessity of Scripture, that without these spectacles, Calvin calls them, we can't see God correctly, we can't see ourselves correctly, we can't see the world correctly. That, that's where I would start if I had, you know, five minutes with someone or in an episode like this to just give people kind of a handle on what are we talking about about the doctrine of Scripture would be those four attributes. Mm -hmm. Perhaps a danger in talking about the doctrine of Scripture would be that we could handle it in a way where we weren't amazed. Yes. That God has spoken, that we are people of a book, and the implications of that, that Christians are people of a book, are so significant. Any of those that you want to draw out, implications that we're, a, we're people of a book. There's so many, so that that God is a God, he, he hasn't left himself in a cloud of unknowing. I mean, he, he could have. He'd, I mean, even think a command, we think, well, command's bad news. Think of how bad the news would be if God had a way for us to live and he didn't tell us. Mm -hmm. And he told us in a way that couldn't be understood. But he's, he's spoken to us. So we have a God, it, it really, the doctrine of scripture, has to be connected to our doctrine of Christ and our doctrine of God. It has everything to do with a triune God who wants to be known, knows how to be known, and communicates in a way that uh, is just as perfect and authoritative as he is. So 
all of that, that we're people of the book, says something about God who condescends to speak to us. It says something about us as people, how important our words are, what a gift human language is, how much our words can inspire, edify, build up, or, or tear down, and how carefully we must handle the scriptures if these indeed are the very words of God, that in, in John 10, Jesus says the scripture cannot be broken. He goes to one word in the text from mm -hmm. the Psalms to make his point. If, if the inspiration is down to the very words, then how careful we ought to be in handling these words and trying to understand. And you're absolutely right. We lose quickly our amazement that we have a God who speaks to us in a way that we can understand. Mm -hmm. And an important question today for guys like me and you who are involved in what some people would call a gospel-centered movement, a kind of a renewed focus and desire to make the gospel central, is the question, what is the relationship between the Word of God, the Scriptures, and the Word of God, the gospel? You want to address that for us? Help us with that? I think the tendency is to put too much of a wedge there. Mm -hmm. Okay. We, we want to say, yes, we don't deify the scriptures. And yet I find John Frame helpful here that he says, well, we almost do. Okay. Not the actual pages and the artifact of it, whether it's a, a DVD or a thumb drive or a, a printed book. Not that as our... but. We see from the very beginning, God manifests himself in his word. The word is present at creation. And the word is made flesh. I mean, there's a reason that that theology comes to us as the logos, as God's communication, as his word. So God is present wherever his word is present. So I think the bigger danger is in thinking of the Bible much less than Jesus did. I mean, I don't see... I don't know personally people that are are deifying the Bible in an unhelpful way, putting it there and they're doing prostrations to it or something. But I do know people who are so eager to say, well, the word capital W, the word little w, that they're not doing justice, that in both instances, it's God's gracious self-disclosure. And one is no less divine than the other. Uh, that he showed himself in his son and that he shows himself in his word that they are absolutely of a piece. And I think that's what you see in texts like Hebrews 1 and carrying out the argument to the end of Hebrews 3 and 4, that the revelation the redemptive, and the redemptive work of Christ are absolutely connected and can't be separated. Hmm. Any points for Christian leaders as they do personal Bible study, teach others to do personal Bible study of uh, orientation on the scriptures uh, and in terms of do we handle them all the same? Uh, any kind of basic pointers you'd give as we begin to dive into the scriptures and begin to appropriate them? How to exegete the text, hermeneutics, just the, the, yeah. the big words. Basically, how, how do we interpret it? How do we approach mm. the Bible? That's what you're asking about. Uh, I mean, a few things that come to mind are to realize that it's made of, of 66 books, and they're written by a number of different authors, and they're different types of books. I think just to get that in a, a layperson's head or a, an elder training or leadership training in your church is really important, that you don't read Proverbs the same way you read Leviticus, that the nature of a proverb is to be a kind of, you know, this is the way the world is sort of aphorism. It's not an ironclad law of gravity to read a narrative different than you read uh, the letters of Paul, to understand that everything that is descriptive in Scripture is not also prescriptive, that the Bible is often telling us the story of redemption and often without comment. And so you have to look at other clues to know, is this being held up as a good example, a bad example, or just telling us what to do? So, for example, this... Uh, coming up, I'm, I'm preaching on Acts, so I'm going to preach on replacing Judas. And so they draw lots. And I find, I found a number of churches that would say, that's a really good idea how mm -hmm. you should pick your elders. or your. They usually stop at elders. They don't go to pastors. That somehow feels yeah. a little too good. They don't do it for their wives. But <laughs> for elders, 
They say, well, no, there's, there's a, a description there that shouldn't be prescriptive for us. It's just helpful as we help people understand how Scripture works and holds together. And then obviously, but maybe not obviously, is to see that it's telling a single story. It's telling a story about Jesus Christ. It's telling the story about how can a sinful people live with a holy God and how he makes a provision for us to do that and understand that it's a good news story, a Jesus story all the way through. So for a leader who's listening to us here saying, you know what, here they are talking about Scripture for 10 plus minutes now. I'm feeling a sense of conviction that I'm, I'm not engaging with God's own speaking in the book like I should. Any place you'd send them uh, to learn some basics of Bible study, a resource you've used in the past or ever point people to where they could go from here? So books on Friendship. the Bible. Yeah, well, there's, there's lots of them. Uh, course to think of one right now. I love J.I. Packer's book on fundamentalism and the Word of God. It's just a good defense of Scripture. He has a book on, uh, called Truth and Power, which may be out of print now, which was also very good about the doctrine of Scripture. Uh, John Frame's book on the mm, doctrine of the Word good. of God. It looks more intimidating than it needs to be because he puts every, you know, reform fight he's ever been involved in in the appendices in the back. So it's, it's like half that big and the chapters are very readable. So I would uh, recommend that book. And Bible study interpretation tools, you know, the, um, what's the book? Uh, you remember the name, the 40 questions on the Bible, the series that Kriegel's yeah. been putting out. Uh -huh. um, I apologize to because I really like the book and his name is escaping me right now, Southern guy but on 40 questions to ask the Bible. Okay, okay. That's what we use in our leadership Bennington. training course. No, Somebody else. Okay. he did a mission book. I'll think of it right after we're done here. Plummer, Robert Plummer. Oh, That's okay. who it is, yeah. Very good book. Uh, that would be, if you just got one book, because we just have for our training class, that's the book we have them read because it goes through all the stuff about genre, has a good section on canon. Hmm. It, it's really, and it's laid out in a real user-friendly way. I found the Zondervan series, Carson Moo, Longman Dillard, is some helpful getting yes. background information yep. on And then Andy Nacelli books. did an abbreviated yes. version of very the Carson Moo one. Yeah, that's very good for background introductory material. Craig Blomberg on historical reliability stuff of, of the Gospels, if you're going that angle, can be helpful. And as we close here, any challenge you'd give to Christian leaders in relation to the, this topic of Doctrine of Scripture, the application of it, or however you'd want to charge leaders listening to us? Well, I'll think of those who are primarily teachers in preaching. I have a burden and I see it, I want to be careful about it in my own life, but I think for all the attention we give to expositional, careful, biblical preaching, I still don't think many of us do it very well. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about homiletic skills, I'm talking about actually making your points of the sermon come manifestly from the points in the passage so that our best stuff is coming from, I feel like sometimes we preach our best stuff are our rants, our riffs, our one-offs, our stories. Mm -hmm. I could be guilty of that too. Our best stuff is coming from the connections we're seeing in Scripture. So I, I still think we need to hear that exhortation, especially as pastors and preachers to labor, to study, to show ourselves to be those who are handling the Word of God rightly and deeply and profoundly mm. and giving it to our people Sunday after Sunday. Mm. Would you turn that exhortation into a prayer for our listeners? I would. Father in heaven, I pray for my own preaching ministry, which has its own deficiencies, I'm sure, and for every other man listening who is charged with the solemn task of preaching your word, that you would give us a desire to be in your word. We would study it on our own for our own personal benefit and relationship with you, and week by week we would study it carefully from the original languages if we're able. We would rely on your spirit in our own hard work even before our books and we would study hard to know and to get at all the treasures that are in your word. Oh Lord, help us to work hard for 
we will be gloriously repaid with all the treasure that you have for us there in your word. Amen.